The theme of today is true home, authenticity, wholeness, and boldness for people of color Dharma practitioners. So I recognize that some of us may self-identify as Buddhist, others may not. Some folks I know say, I'm not Buddhist, but I'm Buddhistic. <laughs> and then others have said, who are Christian or other religions will say, I'm not even Buddhistic, but I'm Buddhistical. <laughs> uh, meaning that they resonate with some of the teachings and practices and like to participate. So wherever we're coming from, uh, our paths have brought us together here this morning. It's really auspicious to be together as people of color, I feel. And I really appreciate your attention to this theme, which I'm very interested in right now, which is authenticity, wholeness, and boldness. Uh, so the bell of mindfulness, this is the bell of mindfulness. There's a big one, here's a little one, They're various sizes. Um, and we can also use the telephone ringing or the sound of a child's voice. We can actually use anything. It doesn't have to literally be a bell. In this Thich Nhat Hanh tradition, uh, the bell of mindfulness can actually be any sound in which when we hear it, we remind ourselves. So mindfulness is reminding ourselves, right? Reminding ourselves of our true home, of our true purpose, of our intention, of um, our vows and our commitments uh, to our spiritual path, our activist path, whatever our path in encompasses, we're gonna remind ourselves when we hear the sound of the bird singing. It can be, uh, for instance, we heard, I heard a siren going earlier during the meditation and my practice, one of my practices is when I hear a siren, I'm aware that uh, someone may, might have had a heart attack or there might be a fire, there might be injury, there might be people who are experiencing some fear or anxiety and therefore what I do is I just send out that energy of metta or unconditional loving kindness, of goodwill, of friendliness and in my heart I just say may may you be safe may you be well and happy and uh, and send that energy out when I hear the siren so we can actually use anything as a bell of mindfulness and then we actually do have a bell of mindfulness also in the meditation hall and the mindfulness the meditation poem or gata in this tradition the Thich Nhat Hanh tradition says listen listen this wonderful sound brings me back to my true home. Now I know that originally I believe when uh, Venerable Master Thich Nhat Hanh wrote this in English, I think it said, it brings me back to my true self. And that at a certain point he changed it to my true home, which I really, which I really love. I love uh, the whole concept of home and hominess. And that leads us to the question of, uh, so this is not a quiz. There is no answer that I will make up for you. It's, this is a question for you to just contemplate and take into your heart. And that question is, where is my true home? Where is my true home? And the second question is, how do I know when I have arrived? How do I know when I have arrived in my true home? So as practitioners, some of us of the way of wisdom and compassion, uh, the teachings of the Buddha, as well as any wisdom teachings that encourage wisdom and compassion, as people of color and multiracial folks, as multicultural persons, and I was so glad that we had the chance to hear some of the richness in the circle, as human beings of many varied generations, gender identities, sexual orientations, ethnicities, abilities, body shapes and sizes, and many, many more what we call dimensions of diversity, uh, I think it's especially meaningful for us to ask, where is my true home? And how do I know when I have arrived in my true home? So this morning, 
I want to propose that uh, we come home and that we arrive uh, in a sense of joyful authenticity. So whatever it means to you to be your authentic self, uh, in wholeness, whatever it means to you to be your whole self, uh, and obviously they're linked, and also to arrive at our true home in compassionate boldness, or what my new mantra is, just as of about a, two weeks ago, is bold compassion. Mm. Bold compassion. I'm really into boldness. Maybe it's turning 60, you know. Uh, I don't know what, but I'm becoming quite bold. <laughs> Having been raised as a kind of timid Japanese American, just over the years I've gotten increasingly bold. And I was recently at a uh, meeting of our People of Color Sangha Coordinating Committee at East Bay Meditation Center in Oakland, where I teach and work. And we were uh, meeting about some things that were kind of troubling to the heart and were a little naughty, were a little gnarly. So I suggested that we uh, adopt this posture of bold compassion because action needed to be taken. And at the end, I suggested we all take hands and we raised our hands and we all shouted, bold compassion. <laughs> And you could just feel the sense of confidence, of encouragement, because uh, we had the wisdom that we needed in, in the circle of that wonderful committee. Uh, Thich, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, and I was saying to someone that I've grown familiar, very familiar with his teachings because over 26 years, I know a lot of people in the Thich Nhat Hanh communities, and the way I've known them is over 26 years, I'm a freelance uh, Buddhist proofreader. There's a niche for you, um, which I just kind of made for myself. I actually had no formal training. But it's true, I was an English major. And 26 years ago, I was introduced to Arnie Kotler and his partner, Therese Fitzgerald. And they were students of Thich Nhat Hanh. And uh, I had just read Being Peace which had come out and I was just stunned because I went through very hardcore boot camp Zen training and which had a lot of discipline and had a I mean the practice was quite wonderful for me and it was it was very boot camp and so when I read uh, Being Peace I remember I just sat and I wept it just fed my heart and when he talked about gentleness and kindness and uh, just the way that, that he does and that wonderful kind of spirit of loving kindness and a very, very actually very affectionate. Uh, I remember I just wept and I felt that part of myself that had not been um, brought forth in my practice. So there we have the wholeness of it had suddenly been restored and validated by this, this teacher. However, Having been an English major, I also noticed there was a typo on about every other page, and it really <laughs> annoyed me. So when I had the chance to meet Arnie Kotler, I said, um, being peace changed my life. Thank you, Arnie. Thank you. It's such a wonderful book. And I noticed a typo on every other page. And I wonder who your proofreader is. And he just smiled gently, and he said, proofreader? <laughs> and I said, yeah, do you have a proofreader? He said, no, we're just starting out. And he looked at me and he said, would you like to be our proofreader? <laughs> and I said, sure. And that's how a whole kind of sub-career as a Buddhist <laughs> proofreader started. <laughs> so I've, I've read, uh, proofread a lot of his books, not all of them, but a lot of his books in English. And Thich Nhat Hanh says that in the practice of dana, which is the practice of generous giving, um, it's one of the great spiritual practices, probably in all traditions, uh, that he says we might give money, uh, we might give material goods, and like clothing, and food, and shelter, and all of these things are good, he says. And the best gift, the highest form of dana, which I personally believe, is the gift of non fear. Okay? The gift of non-fear. Can we give the gift of non-fear to ourselves and can we give it to others? So I mentioned I'm a mother. My uh, only child is over 25 now and I've worked uh, with 
children from babies to young adults during all the time he was going through the Oakland Public Schools, K through 12. I was a steady volunteer. I taught literature as a volunteer for four years in his high school, still in touch with a lot of these uh, young adults by Facebook. It's wonderful to see them, they're, them doing well. And I was really aware that particularly, I mean, those schools were in Oakland. And so we had all of the occurrences that one might expect of, of being in a city like Oakland. We had students whose relatives um, were being deported in immigration raids. We had students whose, uh, uh, in one case, whose um, boyfriend was murdered in a drive-by shooting. And all of this, uh, those schools were the microcosm of what was in Oakland. So I was really, really aware that I had to increase my own level of non-fear and that one of the things that I wanted to impart most to these young people was, was the gift of non-fear, of confidence. Like, you can reach your goals, and this school is going to be a safe, good place for you. This is, this is going to really be a place where you can find uh, another home for education and for community. So this gift of non-fear and bold compassion is meant to cultivate fearlessness. And sometimes people get all bent out of shape because they think, oh, that must mean that I can't feel fear and I'm not going to experience any fear and I'm not going to tremble and I'm not going to be all scared, uh, which is completely ridiculous <laughs> because uh, there is fear which is built into us in terms of how we evolve that is useful and that is necessary. And I always say that if we see a bus that's barreling down as we're trying to cross the street, and it's going to completely run through the red light and run us over, it is very appropriate to feel fear. And that fear is going to make us get ourselves out of the way. Um, and, and so uh, feel fear when we need to feel fear when it helps us. However, there's much fear and anxiety, which I know from personal experience, that does not help us. And it, um, I think that we can see in our society as we read the, the media, and I'll just notice, because I practice mindfulness for a long time, what states are arising in me when I see certain headlines. And sometimes head headlines these days are often meant to create fear, because fear can be motivating to suck you in and get you to read that or listen to it. And in fact, uh, my mother's... Um, my mother grew up in Hawaii, and I have very close relatives, including a cousin who's a Buddhist priest on the Big Island of Hawaii, which is big. It's called the Big Island because it's big. It's the size of Rhode Island. has lots of different ecosystems. My cousin is in the Kona area with her temple, uh, Daifukuji, Soto Zen Temple. And one of the people in my sangha in Oakland sent me an email, and it said that the title of the email was something like, Lava flow on big island, evacuations. And instantly I thought, OMG, OMG, why haven't I heard about this? Wasn't it on Facebook? I mean, has the big island blown up? Literally, I remember that thought crossing through my mind. Has the big island, which is volcanic, suddenly blown up? And so then I click on the link, and it turns out that it's the town of Pahoa, which is this tiny town that I've been to uh, near... Volcano National Park, and it is true that the lava is kind of eating up their roads and has started flowing toward them. It also said that it's been flowing in that direction since June. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, this was not a case of sudden some catastrophic movie happening and the whole island blowing up. And that was a good lesson for me. I thought, okay, I instantly went into fear mode instead of thinking, hmm, I wonder what this means, and looking into it. So with bold compassion, we don't deny the fear. And instead, what I would propose is that we expand around it, that we get in touch with the fear, and we also get in touch with the space around it. So what I'd like to invite you to do is to uh, look around the yurt and find some object 
that's a discrete object that you can see. It could be the bell, it could be that clock, but you'd recognize it as an object. Like there's a kind of a folding table over there. I see a Kleenex box and just focus once you've picked your object. Probably not a person because no one likes to be stared at. <laughs> so find an object, right? And just stare at it very intensely. It's like the, it's the only thing you're seeing. And now without moving your head, soften your gaze and become aware of the space around that object all the way out to the perimeter of your vision. So we'll notice that we're, we're still aware of the object, in my case, the Kleenex box. And then by softening my gaze and becoming aware of the space around it, I'm aware of so much more and I'm also aware of context. In other words, to see the bigger picture. We can be in touch with our fear, and we can also be in touch with the space around the fear, which may contain elements of joy, of non-fear, of, of many, uh, many wonderful things, uh, or uh, could also uh, be in touch with elements of real danger where we need to take some action. In other words, we, we begin to access our intelligence and our wisdom by becoming aware of the space around uh, that fear. We can learn to become more the quality of what the Buddha taught as the lion's roar. So sometimes, I think there's a sutta or sutra or, or teaching discourse of the Buddha uh, called the lion's roar. And it's, um, uh, or maybe it's a text of, of Buddhism that no, I think it is a, it's, it's a sutta or sutra of, of the Buddha. In any case, the emphasis is on this quality of non-fear and, and where we can hear the truth, where we can be in our true home, where we can reclaim our ancestors, our heritage, the wholeness of all that we are, qualities that we might feel are negative, qualities that we feel are positive. They all are who we, oh, part of who we are. I'm not saying that we don't want to improve or transform things that might be harmful in us. I'm just saying we can recognize it's all there. We don't have to try to be pretend to be nicer or kinder or more perfect than we are because that usually, in my experience, ends up coming out very badly. Uh, I'm a big a fan of what I call the practice of imperfection. <laughs> Let's allow ourselves to be imperfect and also to try to improve uh, in a way that, that works for us. And that's a form of generosity as well. So I'm, I want to go back to this quality of the lion's roar. I was at, I just mentioned my cousin's uh, temple in Hawaii, and I was very fortunate to be invited there in March of this year because they're celebrating their centennial year. 100 years of American Buddhism uh, in Hawaii, Daifukuji Soto Zen Mission Temple. And I gave several talks in different parts of that temple uh, to different, like uh, there, there was a public talk and then we did a day of mindfulness. And then I was invited to the Sunday morning group, which is the family, the family group. And there are these cute little kids there and so what I invited them to do was, I said, do you all know where the wild things are? You know, and they said, yes. And I said, well, I'll tell you, my favorite part of where the wild things are is where, because I was really encouraging them. I said, we want to build up our fearlessness. We, we, want to, we want to kind of develop the ability to do this lion's roar. And I said, so I always think of where the wild things are, where it says, and the wild things, what rolled their terrible eyes and gnashed their terrible teeth and showed their terrible claws. And the kids are like this. <laughs> and I said, so OK, wild things, let's do a wild things roar. Because you know, then it says, the wild rumpus began. So I went, roar! And they looked at me, and I said, and they kind of went, roar. <laughs> I said, no, kids, that's not good enough. 
We've got to give it our all. Roar! And that time they gave out a mighty roar. And once again, we could feel that energy of, of joyfulness and of encouragement and of confidence and self-empowerment rising. Uh, so we can really teach our kids and ourselves to do that, that uh, lion's roar of non-fear. Meaning, the way it manifests is that we're, I feel boldly willing to experiment, to try new things, and to find like-minded folks. Like, I was just thinking how wonderful it is that somehow this pathway opened through uh, connections to May and to John, and then I was talking to uh, Sason, the teacher here, and going over all the connections. I never met her before, but we have mutual Dharma connections through Zen Center of Los Angeles and the folks I've known there. And, uh, and just really feeling how miraculous and wonderful it feels to me to be here with all of you and that our separate paths have come together and Jimmy from the library whom I've met, and uh, to really feel that uh, we're, we're able to come together in community to, I hope, even in, in ways that are smaller to larger, to create the communities in which we want to live. So that's a theme that's part of a diversity and inclusion community that I'm part of that's worked with, and to say that Let's start here and let's start now and let's continue the work that I'm sure all of you are doing to create the communities in which we want to live. Uh, we can't really wait around for the dominant system to give us everything we need. Of course, we're, we work and we lobby to get funding, to get, uh, to get what we need from, from the dominant system. And we also know I think uh, as, as people of color, as multiracial folks, as people in various um, communities that have been targeted historically for oppression and continue to be, that we can, in a grassroots way, also create so many forms and resources for ourselves that help us all to be go in the direction of non-fear and start to uh, create what Grace Lee Boggs, a veteran activist, calls visionary activism instead of protest activism. So it's one thing to always be angry and protesting, and there is, uh, I think, a, a place for that. Of course, there is. Uh, she also points out, let's be visionary. Let's envision what it is that we want and need, and then not perfectly, imperfectly as best we can go about with boldness and compassion to start creating these forms. Um, I was hearing more about how this community, Sweet, Sweetwater Zen Center, was formed. Pretty amazing story. We can encourage ourselves by realizing that uh, folks who want to start communities, folks who want to start a people of color mindfulness group, we can do it. Be willing to start small, and then just just to do do what we can in a sustainable way and at certain times and places the conditions and causes will be ripe for that to expand and to grow and not everything actually has to expand or grow i'm a very short person i like small things <laughs> <laughs> and small things can be very powerful and very good okay Boldness, the quality of boldness helps us get unstuck. Uh, it might also have fierceness in it. Uh, what for Buddhists, we might look at the Manjushri wisdom sword. Uh, actually, I'm sometimes being called the badass Buddhist these days because <laughs> I'm just becoming more that way as I get older. <laughs> However, uh, the important thing for that as practitioners of the way is to also understand that that fierceness does not contain within it hurtful aggression. We can be fierce for the cause of what is good, what is just, what is empowering for our children, for our communities, and also look at ways that we can drop off. Uh, someone talked about letting go, that through forgiveness uh, and through letting go, we can 
we can actually see that hurtful aggression diminish and sometimes drop away entirely. So I want to um, propose today that our true home is compassionate boldness. Just to just try it on, just try it on as a concept and idea. My true home is to be boldly compassionate in my own circumstances, in my own life. And to ask yourselves uh, what creative, bold, visionary, and brilliant parts of myself might have been separated or estranged, uh, might have been damaged, might even have been placed in exile from the person that I call me, and yet hopefully I'm aware of them or they might be calling out to me in my dreams, in just little thoughts I have like, oh gee, I, you know, I'm not very good, but I, I wish I could write poetry. Or I just kind of feel like I'd like to do a painting, but I'm not an artist. Oh, I guess I can't do it. Oh, my painting would be really horrible. Well, no one has to see it. <laughs> no one has to read your piece of writing if it makes you feel embarrassed. That should not stop you. You're a free person. If you've even got five minutes, if you've got half a day to do a painting, I urge you to reclaim those parts of yourself uh, very boldly and with compassion and real, start to realize those potentials and welcome back, welcome back those parts of yourself. And find ways to um, recognize opportunities for bursts of creativity that perhaps as children got socialized out of us or we made a, might have had a teacher who said, well, why are you making the sky green? The sky is blue. You have to make the sky blue. I mean, people actually do, will we'll internalize those things, and then that constricts our thinking in ways we don't even need to constrict it. The sky is not always blue. I mean, just go out and look <laughs> during a sunset or a cloudy day. Uh, and it could be green at times. So um, when I was doing what I call this hardcore boot camp Zen training, I developed, uh, I do have a background in the fine arts, and I developed little ways of having these outbursts of freedom and creativity without disturbing anyone. Mm -hmm. And so in Zen, there's often a practice that's greatly inward. It's great for concentration. I mean, it is. It's a practice where you can develop incredible concentration, which has a lot of benefits. And then also, it can just become so concentrated. And people are going around in complete silence. The eyes are cast down. You're not making any eye contact. And uh, the concentration's getting deeper and deeper. But at least in my experience in the community that I was trained in, it can also get very tense. It's very tense because people's stuff is there. If you don't know what it is, it's very tense. <laughs> so what I discovered is that the one place that I could be appropriately alone um, and not distract anyone else would be the bathroom. And sometimes I would, you know, I would just be the perfect Zen student, be just contained. I'm quite good at being silent, actually. And then I would go into the bathroom, and I'd mindfully shut the door. And then when I was in there, I would just instantly, like, do this wonderful dance. <laughs> <laughs> and I would feel so much better. <laughs> And I'd go to the bathroom and I'd wash my hands and I'd open the door silently and I'd walk out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just an illustration of actually we can find ways to appropriately uh, find ways to be creative, to, to move, to find joy, to bust ourselves out of even actually beneficial patterns of habits and trainings. Still, a habit is still a habit. And we want to always be in touch with the creative flow of what is possible. What is possible goes far beyond what we're trained to see or think or the habitual ways we do things. Uh, just try brushing your teeth with your other hand, for instance. That was just a one kind of small thing. And these are actually our activities of doing things in ways we don't usually do them, 
breaking through our own habits that are now being recommended for, uh, for people to keep flexibility in the brain and that will help to ward off like Alzheimer's and dementia. So they, they have a very practical usage as well. And you'll notice that uh, the example I gave of breaking out of those habit patterns and being in touch with creativity in a very whimsical way actually involved moving the body. And that more body movement can literally help us get our energies unstuck and into dynamic motion. So there is a reason why we call it the civil rights movement, why we call it the women's movement, the gay rights movement, uh, all of these liberatory movements uh, we call movements because things are moving, they're changing, they're getting unstuck from the destructive or oppressive ways that have been entrenched into the society. One of my new mottos as well is that our movements need more movement. So I was recently at the National Gathering in Oakland of the Buddhist Peace Fellowship and I, I'm very close to those folks. I've been a member of BPF for years and the thought of an all weekend meeting even listening to wonderful people with great content. So this is no reflection on the content of just like sitting and listening or maybe sitting and participating in exercises, but you're still sitting there. I thought, I just can't stand that. That just sounds really not good to me. And I know I'm gonna come out of it at the end edified, but kind of stiff. So I contacted a Facebook friend who is also a member of the Buddhist Peace Fellowship in Minneapolis who had said at one point he's a certified yoga teacher. And I talked to him on the phone, he's also a great writer, but never met him in person and I said, Nathan, I can't stand the thought of just sitting through a whole weekend of session after session. How about we propose a yoga class? And so we made up a class of yoga for, uh, for social justice activists. We proposed it, it was accepted, and I made a big banner of something that Nathan wrote me, which said that our movements need more movement. And that was our motto on the side. It was very well attended, and it, it was a wonderful way of just feeling good and at, at home in our bodies during this long and very excellent meeting. So I invite you to practice daily joyful movement as your true home. Because uh, it is in compassionate boldness and in wholeness that we're able to show up with authenticity. So, so this, this quality of compassionate boldness, I feel, enables us to welcome in wholeness. And in wholeness, then we're able to show up with authenticity. So bold, compassionate, whole, authentic presence. I would say that's you and that's me as we truly are. We're going in the direction of acknowledgement, of integration, and then of healing of the fracturings, the displacements, the intergenerational traumas that as people of color we know so well. So it may be that we are all uh, experts of our own pain and the pain of our people. And we can also, by returning to our true home and finding our compassionate boldness, our authenticity, and our wholeness, we can also become experts in the healing of those wounds, in the integration of all the parts of ourselves. And, and and that actually transmits itself to other people, often even without words, with words and without words. Just our physical presence and the way we are, the energy that we carry can, can help to produce healing in our community. And I feel that from, from many people, in fact, all of you here today, that you're already embodying that. So let's go further in that direction as our true home. 
So today I propose that you make a commitment, if you haven't already, silently in your heart, to say, I recognize my authenticity as my true home. I don't need to pretend to be anyone else than who I am in this moment, knowing that that's always changing also. Hopefully we're all changing and we're growing and we can just show up and we can be authentic. And with authenticity, we find ways to be comfortable in our own skin, which I think is a quality that I see and maybe you see in all of the great uh, activist heroes and people that we recognize as powerful leaders. They often have this quality of, of being pretty much at home with themselves and often uh, being at home also with the parts of themselves that may not be so admirable, that may not be so uh, wonderful. Still, they've integrated those parts. They're working with them. They haven't put them into exile. Because we've probably all seen, actually, the shadow side. There is a shadow side to charismatic leadership. And so therefore, as practitioners of mindfulness, we can own our actions and we can take responsibility for the impact of our words, our actions, and our behaviors on our communities and on the environment. Because that would be, I would say, the shadow side of someone saying, I'm bold, I'm whole, I'm authentic, and I can just go around doing and saying anything that I want. Um, so I hope this is not offensive to anyone here, and if it is, I totally apologize. This is just my experience up in Oakland. There was a brief flicker in our community of some folks who said that they were espousing the practice of radical honesty, which is saying whatever you're thinking without putting it through any filters <laughs> whatsoever. And uh, as, as a way of just saying, let's just get it all out there. Hey, we can deal with this. Uh, and then ending up, of course, hurting many, many people's feelings. So being authentic, I would say, means we're also authentically aware, mindfully aware, of the impact of our words and our actions on those around us. Because that helps to create a community that's safe and that has room for people to grow. I believe that essentially an authentic person is willing to be a spiritually mature human being and to become complete. And that we can together awaken into our completeness. We can awaken into our completeness as individuals. We can awaken into our completeness as a community. And therefore we can come into our power and our potential of what we're truly capable of being and of doing. I believe that that's what we're doing right now in this day of mindfulness. And just to add a final uh, story of my own journey of my idea of what is the possible. So with my original uh, Sangha, which is a Korean Zen lineage temple of Zen, the Zen Buddhist temple in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I was there, uh, moved in as a full-time uh, resident under a vow of poverty in 1983. And at that point, the building, it was an old two-story house with a fairly big yard for being in, in Ann Arbor. It was actually, we had about an acre. And we had some, when we moved in, there were like this funky garage. And then there was this funky old outbuilding. I guess it had been a tool shed or something like that. It was kind of like this ramshackle cabin thing out in the yard. So I was indoors, it was in the summertime, and there was a warm rain falling, and I was up in the office, I was an office manager, and someone pokes their head in, this is during the work period on a Saturday afternoon, and says, all right, everyone out in the yard. So in that style of training, you don't say, uh, what's happening? You just run out there and see what you can do to help, you just join right in. So I promptly ran out into the rain, and our carpentry monks had actually elevated, they jacked up this shed that was out there, they put it on rollers, they'd attached ropes to it. And we had our entire sangha or community uh, after the morning meditation was out there. And I ran out and I grabbed a rope and we pulled, we actually moved an entire building. 
with human beings, ropes, and logs from one end of the yard to the other. It was extremely muddy. I fell down. I became instantly covered with mud. With mud. I looked like Piglet from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and it was one of the most glorious experiences of my life because we did that without any kind of high-tech help from anything. And it showed me, as a Sangha and as a community, what we could do if we were all pulling in the same direction in a harmonious manner. It exploded my idea of what was possible. So I know as I look around this, pot, uh, this circle that if we can come, all come into our true homes, whatever form that may take for you, that we can achieve our goals. So I thank you so much. Well, Rest there, and organizers, do we have time for some Q&A? Yep. All right. So we welcome your questions as well as your insights. And if you like, I always invite folks to share your first name, if you wish to do so, before you begin speaking so that we can get to know you better. I have a question. It's not relating to what you're talking about, but more of my Sure. How do you actually surrender without, like, I know during life and through life process, you have to surrender. How do you surrender without feeling like you give up or you're, like, a loser? You know what I'm saying? I, I think I know exactly what you're saying because I've heard this question many times before. And to me, it's similar uh, to the question of, so this ha actually has to do with wordsmithing. And we're, we're often going to hear in Buddhist circles and maybe in some other spiritual circle, circles, well, we need to just accept things the way they are. And this goes over very poorly in people of color circles. It's like, <laughs> hell no. Why would we want to do that? We've been struggling our whole lives against the system. Uh, we're not going to accept things as they are. That is just ridiculous. And so in the same way, the term surrender can exactly come across as meaning, I give up, I'm passive, you can abuse me all you like. In fact, it's, that's the feeling of, right, you know, I just, I just have to surrender. There's nothing, it's powerlessness, it's victim, I'm going to take the victim role. So um, what I would propose is that we don't even use that word if that's actually what it means to you, and to understand it's not intended, in my understanding, to be that at all. Spiritual acceptance within this tradition, the tradition of the Dharma, spiritual surrender, which is we hear in actually in many traditions, is, um, I would say, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has been using the word inclusivity and becoming more inclusive quite a bit. I actually do work sometimes as a diversity and inclusion consultant. So I would say that instead of thinking in terms of surrender, we can think in terms of becoming more inclusive. We can think in terms of recognizing more of the elements of the way things are, and some of which we do have to surrender to in terms of they are the way they are, right? We can't change some things by wishful thinking. Right. If they've already happened and they're in the past, as much as we dislike what it is, we can't change them. So there's surrender to it in, this, in the sense of recognizing and including that reality, and then using our mindfulness to ask ourselves, now what can I do about it? So instead of being passive, it's extremely active. And at the same time, it has that quality of contemplative, contemplative, patient, the contemplative patient ability to just take some time to see more of the elements that are there. I did an introductory training, which was great, in Kingi and nonviolence, uh, the curriculum that comes from the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr and one of their six steps and six principles is it's, it's not all about going out and racing into the street and protesting. Um, it's about first gathering information. 
that's one of their, the steps of Kingian nonviolence. Mm -hmm. Do we understand the situation? Have we gone into the communities and the neighborhoods? Instead of going into a neighborhood, as some organizers sometimes do, and saying, oh my gosh, this is so terrible. Well, I'm going to tell you how to fix it. Instead, getting time to know the people, making relationships, and uh, out of that, then the community's wisdom comes and more information comes. We surrender to more, more information. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jay. And I'm curious, how about this Lions War, war and uh, um, how, how do I can do it for a very short term, but for the long haul, forget it. It's just like I lose steam mm -hmm. after a while. Um, and my thinking is sometimes um, always been an outlier, always been on the fringe of a lot of things in my thinking. And but it's just, to me, it feels it's not part of having the line roar. Is um, it's not part of the it's not part of the dominant culture. It's part of the dominant culture, from my understanding, is being complacent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. doing what you're told, eat your broccoli, that sort of thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> being obedient, being yeah. uh, coloring within the lines. And lines roar, and you know, sort of what we discussed. It seems it's not opposite of it. It's um, it's claiming the space. And yep. so for me, it's like, well, how do I do it for the long term? I can do it for a day or two. Mm -hmm. And then someone remind me to shut up and you know, get back in. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. I mean, does that make sense? It does make sense. It does make sense. So, um, Jay, what I would say to that is that none of us can, can do the lion's roar. I mean, do lions run around roaring continuously? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's just too much energy putting out, and it's not even appropriate in, in all situations. However, in terms of building uh, movements that can help us to claim our space for our cultures, our people, our, um, our children, our, those who are most vulnerable, as well as everyone, uh, I think is, I think the answer is we can't, we can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. We need to do it in community. We do, new, do need to do it in movements. And therefore, what I would said before, seek like-minded people. Maybe it's only one other like-minded person. Or then the two of you may attract another one. Um, I know that there are circles of friendships that are present in this room, as well as circles of organizing and activism that connect to the circles that I'm part of. And once we, and it's really a lot easier these days with social media and with tech uh, can help us to do that. So connect, connect, connect to other people who are doing the lion's roar. And then that's where the continuity lies. Because we might roar and then get worn out and then someone else might roar. And do you see what I'm saying? Together we can do it. So it's like a web. It's completely like a web, yes. And one of the images in the Buddha Dharma, the Indra's teachings nest. of the Dharma, is Indra's nest. No, tell me, how do you understand Indra's nest? It's just a jewel, and we reflect. Um, there's jewels all over this, like, kind of like the universe. And <laughs> each jewel has um, a representative, but like I'm a jewel, and then you're a jewel, and then you're a jewel. And we reflect off each other, and it creates these strands. Um, yeah, it's because I relate to the world through mythology, and so stuff like that for me is easy to plug into. Um, so I understand what you're saying because it's essentially to because I can't do the role all the time, absolutely not. So to find like-minded people and do that. So if you're a node in that net yeah. and you're a jewel that's reflecting all the other jewels. Do you have to be doing everything simultaneously, no. individually? No, because you're already containing it. No. Yeah. So just get in touch with that okay. quality. Yeah. So Margaret, um, sometimes when I find I'm 
the only person of color in a situation, or for example, I'm on the board of the San Diego Psychological Association. I'm the only person of color there. And sometimes I feel like when I say something, I'm not heard, I'm not seen, I'm not even in the minutes somehow. <laughs> And how do, and, and there's always this doubt, is it because, you know, I think in the back of my mind, is it because I'm a person of color? You know, if I was a white man, would this happen? Um, so there's that doubt, but how do you act boldly in situations like that without, without appearing, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Say it. Tacky or, uh -huh. you know, defensive or, hey, me, you know, mm -hmm. you know how do we? act boldly. Um. I feel I totally hear you having come from a lifetime of pretty often being the invisible Asian. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that is mm -hmm. just a kind the of a phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, and what you're saying about not even making it into the minutes, it's like, how is that even possible? Right. Especially if one, I mean, I, you speak fairly loudly and clearly, <laughs> and if you're just kind of muttering, maybe mm -hmm. not, but Mm -hmm. Exactly, I'm hearing you. Uh, I I would say, just from my own experience, that the first thing to do is to learn how to claim space in a way that isn't defensive. We can't control other people's perceptions. Mm -hmm. We might come across as the angry Asian uh, mm -hmm. when we feel we're being assertive. Mm -hmm. So we can't control other people's perceptions. However, we can know within ourselves with mindfulness, mm -hmm. am I defensive? Am I angry? Am I ticked off? Which would actually be pretty natural considering all of this. At the same time, we can recognize that that kind of energy is not likely to produce good results. Mm -hmm. And therefore, how do, we, how do we assert ourselves without that kind of aggression? Mm -hmm. And then which other people start to, to defend. And so that involves individual work first, I would say. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I do with folks that I work with who come to me and say, well, there's this problematic situation at work or on this board or in this organization, uh, and I particularly uh, might wrangle with one or two other people and they describe the dynamic, what I ask them to do is to find a housemate, their partner, or a friend with whom they feel completely safe and just do a role play and, and have the other person say the things that sort of set you off or have role play a situation in which you see the minutes, what you had said. You had said like a full paragraph's worth of stuff <laughs> and some darn good suggestions and it's like there's not even mm -hmm. there. And then to role play with your friend a constructive way of assertively giving feedback and of maybe at the next meeting when the minutes are asked to be approved uh, to mm -hmm. say, um, I distinctly remember that I said thus and so mm -hmm. at the last meeting. I would respectfully request that they be added to the minutes mm -hmm. right now before we go ahead and approve them. And you might even make eye contact with a few allies in the room if you have mm -hmm. them and say, mm -hmm. do you remember when I said thus and so? <laughs> right. And they're probably going to say yes. And then that will give, be, give you the validation and a foothold to, mm -hmm. to get those minutes mm -hmm. in. But remaining silent is not the answer. Right. Um, gosh, this has brought up so many things for me. And I, I want to share a really, uh, an experience that I had where I w it was kind of like a, in an inter, and this is an area that I'm very interested in, is um, intercultural communication. Because I think there are, this is something that is very rarely addressed, is there's a lot of talk about, you know, uh, communication with, with whites or, you know, of people from the dominant culture, but not very much about intercultural communication. And I found there to be almost as many problems in that area as there are with the, you know, with the, and in, I had an experience once with the Native American community. I was not raised Native American, however, I do have lineage that is Native American uh, on both sides of, of my parents. Um, I was raised as Mexican American. And I found myself through my work in recovery um, um, being in a position to be an organizer in the urban Native American community. And this was like in the early 90s. 
and I was asked to develop a uh, family night. And uh, I, you know, at first I kind of like my, my heart sank. And I, how in the heck am I going to do this? How am I going to be accepted? How am I going to be received? And it was very scary for me, very scary. Uh, because I was still really just kind of learning about the community, learning about the culture myself. And, um, and then it was, I was given the suggestion to uh, meet with one of the elders in the community who knew everybody in the community. And so um, part of my lion's roar was really not feeling like a lion, but more like a baby. Of, of you know a baby lion <laughs> <laughs> that's still a lion a baby lion and and because I had to get move out of myself mm -hmm. who I you know uh, my own way of being and put myself out there and be vulnerable yeah I had to allow myself to be vulnerable and allow myself to you know, because one of the things I learned about the Native American community, if you go around saying I'm an Indian and you don't have an Indian card or if you don't, you know, know who your tribe is, you're going to be in trouble. You know, you're going to be in trouble. They're going to say, oh, yeah, okay, cool. And, but I had to be very honest and knowing that, especially in San Diego, uh, there are a lot of mixed feelings between Native Americans from here and Mexican, Mexicans in general. There's a lot of negativity there. And um, so I had to put myself out there as a friend and say, this is, this is my background. I know that I have Native American ancestry. I just don't know what it is. I had to be honest about that. Mm -hmm. you know. And that was very scary for me, very, very scary, because I could find myself easily being dismissed you know, or ignored and not heard. But um, with, my, with my work, eventually, step, one step at a time, you know, um, with not very much, even with not very many people to fall back on, except my friend who was an elder, she was compassionate enough to support me in this. And then I had, of course, the, the uh, director of the program who was supportive of me. So fortunately, there were people who had some power in the community and some collateral in the community to be behind me in what I was doing. But I also had to be mindful, you know, at each step of the way and show my friendship to people. You know, anytime there were, uh, you know, I worked with a youth group, anytime there were people who came from San Francisco down to visit us, I had to shake hands with each one of them and look them in the eye and be welcoming and be um, a student actually to, to hear and know where they were coming from, what they wanted. You know, so in a sense, I began to take on the role of actually, um, um, I'm here to serve, you know. And really, I had to, throughout the whole thing, I realized that, that stepping out of my fearlessness had to take on the role of being there to serve, having that role. And then, Eventually, when it, it actually grew and be, was very successful and lasted for actually many years, even after I left the, the, the center, it was still going on. And, um, so, and people knew about me, even up the state, they knew who I was, but yet I didn't feel it. I didn't feel like a lioness. I didn't feel like a lion at all. Anything but, you know. And yet I knew that people knew who I was not that it really gave me any sense of, it didn't feed my ego or anything like that because I know in that community, it's all about community. It's not about an individual. So in that sense, um, it took on, it looked differently than, you know, a lion looks like roaring and being this thing that you look at and yeah, you're really powerful. But in this sense, it was about stepping out into fearlessness it meant letting go um, being humble, um, being vulnerable, and being willing to serve. Wonderful, thank you. And I would say um, we, we don't need to be limited by the idea of the lion's roar, because in what you're saying, being willing to step out, I heard you say being willing to be vulnerable to me, I hear that as a lot of boldness, right? Yeah, so we could use a different image. We could use a different the servant leader. I hear, I hear in there will the willingness to be a student, being friendly to everyone, 
um, there's so much boldness in there that someone who's kind of shrinking back or, or very shy would find that extremely challenging. Maybe that was you, and you did it. You put yourself out there. And it worked. So thank you for that. Okay, I have another question. Um, I know that creating attachment to STEM leads to sometimes suffering or whatnot. How do you fearlessly create attachment with a community, with a person, so forth without the fear of losing it or being suffered in the future. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I do feel I know what you're saying. So um, the answer to that in again in this tradition is the question is how do we create healthy attachment? Yeah, without being fear that you'll lose it. Without being afflicted by the fear of yeah. Oh, now I have this great community, but what if I lose it? Oh, now I have this great job. Wait a minute, what if I'm laid off? Oh, I have this great kid. What if he ends up doing alcohol and drugs? Or, you know, just all of these things as human beings. And it's not unreasonable, actually, to think these things. Uh, what we can do, I would say, is to really cultivate a daily practice as much as possible, actually as 24-7 as possible, of finding a way to remind ourselves. So reminding is mindfulness. Right. Is, uh, a lot of mindfulness is remembering. Is to get ever deeper into what we regard as the truth of impermanence. That it is the nature of everything to change. It is the nature of it, right? And impermanence is good. A lot of times as human beings, we think, what if I lose something I value? Right. That's, that's what we think of as impermanence. But without impermanence, a baby would never become a young adult. Without impermanence, morning would never change into lunchtime, <laughs> no matter how hungry we got. <laughs> um, do you see what I'm saying? Yes. That actually we can look at all of impermanence as one big package. There are parts of it we don't like, there are parts of it that we like, so we might not even think of it as impermanence, but it is. And therefore, every day to remind ourselves, it is of the nature of things to change, just in a really healthy way. And that's how we really become mature, because then when the change occurs that we don't like, that's already kind of built into our brains to say, oh, this is frightening, this is unpleasant, I didn't want to lose my cat. Right. Of course, I didn't want to lose my beloved relatives. Right. Oh, I love that job that was my dream job, and now the company has downsized. And then there's part of our brain that will say, it is a nature of everything to change. How can you roll with the punches? Do you have like any exercise or anything that you yourself do that Google will be your friend. <laughs> uh, there is actually a practice from Tik or that came through Thich Nhat Han because it's not from Thich Nhat Han. It comes from the actual suttas and the teachings of what are said to be the historical Buddha, and that's called the Five Remembrances. Can you remember that? <laughs> so Google that and you'll you'll find it. And okay. these are traditional teachings, and. The, the trick is, if you're prone to depression or if you read them and it just bums you out, don't do it. <laughs> but you know that it's there. It's when we become kind of resilient and strong enough to say, okay, this is really kind of freaks me out and I'm gonna, I can work with it. So the five remembrances are that we remember, um, I am of the nature to sometimes um, become ill. I cannot escape the reality of sometimes getting flu or worse, you know, because we do, right? Yeah. Our bodies do that. And sometimes we may get cancer. Um, I am of, because I am of, being in a human body, that is the nature of things. I am of the nature to, um, to grow older. I cannot escape from the reality of growing older. And we don't even want to in the case that we want to see our kids grow up. But then when it becomes the afflictive old age, that's a problem sometimes. 
I am of the nature to die. Everyone and everything dies. Uh, I cannot escape from that, the reality of the nature of, of things to die. And it's good for some things to die. I mean, without things dying, we can never even have a salad. You know, <laughs> we have to cut those greens, and it's, it's life always recycling itself. Uh, I am of uh, the nature to be set. This one's hard for me. I'm the, of the nature to be separated from everyone and everything I hold dear at some points. We do need to let go at various points, and uh, that I cannot escape from that reality. And so the, the fifth remembrance is, my actions are the ground on which I stand. It's, that one's different. It's pointing to the fact that taking all of that into account, we need to look at our everyday actions, we take responsibility for their consequences, and then we go forward as courageously as we can in our life with the five remembrances.